Thank you very much for the introduction. German ladies and gentlemen, first of all, my warmest regards from my boss, Professor Büchler, who is unfortunately not able to be here, as you have heard, for medical reasons. So he asked me to give this lecture in his place, and this gave me the opportunity to come here and to see your country for the first time, and I really enjoy this day. Um, I want to give you a short introduction about our department in Heidelberg. As you see, this is the city of Heidelberg with the old town, the castle, and the old bridge. And this is our department of surgery here in front. These are the doctors working in the department. About 100 doctors are working in our department, including staff from scientific and so on. And we are operating in six theaters every day. And this gives us, of course, the opportunity to perform quite a lot of visceral surgery. This is why I was invited. You know, Heidelberg is pretty famous for pancreatic surgery. We are performing approximately 50 to 60 pancreatic operations per month. And we are, in the meantime, having an overview over nearly 7,000 operations. Um, most of them, of course, performed to pancreatic tumors and to chronic pancreatitis, as you see in this slide. Some other tumors, like metastasis to the pancreas and so on, are, of course, some rally indications and other pancreas pathology like acute pancreatitis is going down very much or pancreas transplantation um, is also some indication which is more rarely performed in our department. Three out of four of these operations are pancreas resections. The other procedures are drainage procedures or sometimes only exploration of the patients if we find irresectability. And we, of course, perform a lot of pancreatic head resections. We used to perform pylorus preserving ripple procedures as the standard treatment in Heidelberg. We just started around last year to change this a little bit and to try to resect the pylorus to avoid delayed gastric emptying in the post-operative course. And we have, meanwhile, um, started a randomized study on this topic, which is currently recruiting patients. And we will be able to see if this is an advantage in the long run, um, maybe in one or two years. The classical Whipple procedure, as you see here, is going down. We have not performed very many of these procedures. And the duodenum preserving pancreatic head resection to chronic pancreatitis is, of course, another focus of our department. Other resections, like left resections, total pancreatectomies, and segmental enucleations, um, accord to 42% of our performed resections. These are our results. When we look at this, we have a reoperation rate of approximately 9%. Overall fistula rate in our collective is 6.5%, and we are currently performing with a mortality of 3.5%, which you can, of course, not only explain by surgical failure or by surgical reasons, but also by the indications and the patients you operate on, the comorbidities and things like that. You can, of course, adjust your mortality to some extent if you want to. Back to the um, topic of my talk, you know, pancreatic cancer is still a uh, Big problem, incidence of all tumors is number 10 in male as well as in female patients. Still, mortality is up to number 4, which shows the bad prognosis of these patients. And every two or three years, there's a paper coming up like this. Pancreatic cancer is no surgical disease. Pancreatic cancer is not resectable. Pancreatic cancer should not be resected. And if you look at the authors of this paper, these are some German guys from Magdeburg. They are really interested in pancreatic diseases. And still these people write papers like this and conclude that most of the patients are found irresectable under surgery or that even if they are resected, they will not really have a benefit from the resection. So they don't recommend surgery at all. Of course, this is not our point of view. I just wanted to give you this as a background. When we talk about advanced pancreatic cancer, we have to talk about lymph nodes. We have to talk about vessel infiltrations. We have to talk about adjacent organs to the tumor. And of course, the upcoming issue of neoadjuvant treatment within the last 10, 15 years. This has increased um, not only in Japan, but also in Europe and the US. And this is, of course, under discussion at the moment in which patients we should perform this. I will go to this topic at the end of my talk. However, the major aim of pancreatic cancer surgery is a curative resection. This is a rather old study, which my boss performed still in his time in Switzerland. He um, had an investigation of 211 patients regarding the risk factors and the prognostic parameters. And the main outcome of this study is that curative resection has to be achieved. Then you can have a five-year survival of 24%. Even an R1 resection by that time is more beneficial than no resection. And this median survival of 15 to 20 months explains the good outcome from the point of view of the surgeons. We have updated 
these investigations in our Heidelberg Collective with 1,000 resected pancreatic cancer patients and have analyzed these factors once again during the last 10-year period. And what we found is that there are certain risk factors with which increase the risk, certain factors which lower the risk. And as you see in this um, table, the multivariate analysis shows that older age, preoperative diabetes, high tumor markers preoperatively, of course, T4, M1, or G3 tumors from the histological point of view, and non-curative resections, as well as high lymph node ratios, are bad risk factors. What can we do with this? We can stratify the patients. You see, the tumor stages that are not advanced have a much better outcome in this um, figure. Of course, the T3 and T4 tumors are the more common tumors, and they have a worse outcome. But if we apply the risk factors I have just shown you before, we can make a stratification and we can stratify the patients, especially in the most common tumor stage, which is uh, the stage 2B, the node positive patients we have. The T3 and 1 is the classical pancreatic cancer patient. And we can take these patients in four groups with the risk factors and we can see that even in this group, we have five-year survival up to 60%. I think this is enough background to show that resection of pancreatic cancer is still worthwhile and that we cannot have this nihilistic attitude which I showed you in the beginning. Okay, I want to go on to the surgical and oncological aspects of advanced pancreatic cancer. First of all, the lymph nodes. You see down here some radical lymph adenectomy during total pancreatectomy. Of course, this is not our standard approach that you um, clear all the carval vein, all the aorta, and so on. The lymph nodes that are mostly involved are shown in this picture of the Japanese society around the pancreatic head and around the hepatogastric ligament, which you see here. And I want to show you some studies on this. The latest study was published in 2011, randomized study from Japan, 50 patients standard lymph adenectomy versus 50 patients with extended lymph adenectomy. What the authors could show were these things that mainly the lymph nodes I just demonstrated are involved in these patients, means the lymph nodes number 13, 17, 14, and 16, and that these lymph nodes are already taken away during the standard lymph adenectomy. They are always in the resected specimen. The pattern of recurrence is the same. No matter if you do a standard lymph adenectomy or if you do an extended lymph adenectomy, patients suffer from the same rate of local failure or lymph node metastasis in both groups in this study. And this tells us that the extended lymph adenectomy is not much beneficial to the patient. Besides, the factor is the node negative and the node positive patients, no matter if you do extended or standard. This study was already included in a meta-analysis 2007, but it was only published by an abstract by that time. Um, and in this meta-analysis, we probably saw the same results. You have no benefit in survival in extended lymph adenectomy during pancreatectomy, but you have an increased morbidity in terms of lymphatic fistula, diarrhea, bad quality of life, and things like that. Therefore, we think that we should not do an extended lymph adenectomy, but should stay with a standard lymph adenectomy around the pancreatic head, around the right side of the celiac axis, around the right side of the mesenteric artery during pancreatic head resections. Next topic is the vessel infiltrations. This is, of course, the true advanced pancreatic cancer if vascular structures are involved by the tumors. When we talk about this, we have to talk about the venous infiltration and we have to talk about the arterial infiltration. In this paper from 2010, both were included in a collective of 150 patients, half of them without vascular resections, compared with 67 patients with portal venous resections and eight patients with combined resections of arteries and veins. What the authors could show that the five-year and even the 10-year survival was achievable when no vascular structures were resected, but that the survival went down significantly five-year and 10-year when the portal vein was resected and when the arteries were resected, there was no survival after five years and after 10 years. This study led to the conclusion that maybe vascular resection, uh, resections should not be performed during pancreatic cancer surgery. What is the oncological impact of this study? We have analyzed the patient collective in Heidelberg with regard to the portal venous resections, as you see in these CT scans probably quite extensive um, infiltration of the portal vein here and the portal vein, as can be seen in this coronary um, slide. However, you can choose a sharp resection of the portal vein you, without 
taking away the portal vein, this will always end up in an R1 situation, or you can take away the portal vein as a segmental structure, do a primary portal vein anastomosis, which is of course oncologically much more radical. When we look at our collective, we had 110 patients undergoing portal vein resection, and the histological data showed that we could achieve an R0 resection in 50% of the patients versus R1 and R2 in another 50% of the patients and that the portal vein was truly involved in terms of a really tumor infiltration in 80% of these patients, which underlines that the tumor is really aggressive towards the venous structures, which is a bit different from the arterial structures. The vein is always infiltrated. You can probably very rarely perform a sharp dissection, as I showed you in this one picture. The survival in these patients was good. We had a median survival between 14 and 21 months. And the interesting part about this is that we had no significant difference um, regarding the length of resection of the portal vein. If we just took away a little bit and did an end-to-end -end anastomosis, about one centimeter resection, or if we took away four to five centimeters and needed a prosthesis interposition, as it is shown in this slide. So this um, underlines that the portal vein resection should be performed, even if it seems a rather long distance infiltration of the portal vein. And of course, there are a number of other studies around the world. However, the portal vein resection has been a standard and is so put in the current guidelines, in the German guidelines, which are from the year 2007, that the portal vein should be resected whenever technically possible. And these are currently updated in 2013, but there will be the same recommendation in these guidelines. How about the arterial resections? This is a much more difficult topic because this is oncologically a problem and is often surgically a problem. First thing is I want to present you a surgical approach to the artery, the mesenteric artery, this is a so-called artery first approach, which means that you start the dissection of the pancreas before you do anything else, before you go to the lesser sac, before you go to the ligament, before you do a Kocher maneuver, you start on the left side of the ligament of trites, as it's shown here, you open this and you go down to the mesenteric artery in this place, just to make sure that there is no infiltration or there is an infiltration of the artery. You can then clear the artery down to the base at the aorta and can fully rule out or use this as an interposition basis in the following resection. And of course you can then see and clear the artery from this point of view and can really dissect under control. We always combine this approach, the artery first approach, when we have the suspicion of a tumor infiltration to the mesenteric artery with the retrograde dissection of the pancreas, which we call the unsynate first approach. Um, which means you always start the dissection in the caudal direction and you take it up to the cranial um, position. And this gives you a good vessel control and gives you a very convenient cetus during the resection. This is shown in this, pay, uh, in this slide. You start on this portion of the unsynate process. You take this away from the superior mesenteric vein, from the uh, superior mesenteric artery, and then you take the dissection in this direction. You go up along the vascular structures, and finally you have the pancreas attached at this side on the neck of the pancreas, and they can complete the resection in this position. This is just a convenient way to combine it with the arterial first approach and to see if the vascular structures are involved here. This is an example of an arterial resection when the hepatic artery is involved. You see that the hepatic artery has been cut in this position and that the splenic artery has been used for transposition and for revascularization of the liver in this patient, also combined with the portal vein anastomosis. Another possibility to replace the artery is a venous graft interposition. You can see in this slide, this is a um, patient where the celiac trunk was resected down to the basis, and then in the following slide, this is the basis of the celiac trunk. You see the interposition of a venous graft to um, reconnect the liver artery in this position. Of course, we can perform this technically, but what is the oncological impact? The oncological impact is different from the venous impact. This is a meta-analysis from 2011. We included 16 studies in this topic on arterial resections. 366 patients in these studies, which already shows you that it is not performed very common. And compared with 2,200 patients that were resected without artery resection, 
What we could show in this meta-analysis is that the perioperative mortality significantly increases in these patients, that these resections are sometimes dangerous to the patients, and regarding the survival, the one-year as well as the three-year survival in this patient is inferior to the usual survival which we achieve without arterial resection. From this point of view, we have some kind of surgical danger to the patient. We have some kind of questionable oncological outcome in these patients. Therefore, in our opinion, the survival benefit is not really clear. It might be present for a subgroup of patients. We will, from time to time, perform the arterial resection, of course, in young patients where this is possible without big danger to the patient, without prolonging the operation very long and without endangering the post-operative course but this is certainly something which should be reserved to selected patients and which is not a standard approach to the um, resection of advanced pancreatic cancer. The next topic I want to give you a short impression about is the infiltration of adjacent organs by the pancreatic tumor, which is usually the left adrenal gland, the left kidney, the mesocolon or the colon on the right or the left side, wherever the tumor is located, the stomach, um, and maybe sometimes also the liver and so on. So how about resecting these patients? There's a study from 2011 which analyzed this from the Hamburg group and they showed 55 multivisceral resections compared with 300 standard resections and with 150 palliatively treated patients which did not undergo resection but only surgical exploration. What the authors could show that you have an increased morbidity in these patients due to the bigger extent of the operation, of course, due to the surgical trauma you cause, but you have a similar mortality, which means the mortality is not increased in the um, multivisceral resection group, even compared to the palliative bypass surgery group, not only to the standard resection group. Therefore, you can safely perform these procedures. You do not endanger the patients by these procedures. And the outcome from the oncological point of view, what the group from Hamburg could show is that you have a similar survival, not statistically significant in these patients, but the palliative situation is, of course, much worse, which is not surprising. Data from Heidelberg. I can show you on this topic on 100 patients which we have operated with multivisceral resections in all types of resections, ripple procedures, distal pancreatectomies, total pancreatectomies. One out of five of these patients similarly um, underwent uh, synchronous portal vein resection. This is an example, as it is quite often, you have a tumor in the pancreatic tail. This is attached to the left mesocolon and the left semicolon. So you have to take away the mesocolon, you have to take away the colon, you have to take away the spleen. Of course, sometimes the stomach is also attached, so you should take away the stomach in such a patient too. And when you perform these procedures, you of course have a longer operation time, which is not surprising. You of course have an increased blood loss in these procedures because it's a bigger surgical trauma. You have an increased surgical mobility, uh, morbidity in these patients, and you need a bit longer ICU stay. But I think the most important thing is also in our study, we could show that the mortality of these patients, which means the post-operative mortality, is not increased by the multivisceral resections, which means you deal with the complications and you can discharge the patient and he has a benefit from this operation and is not dying in hospital, which is very important in pancreatic surgery. Median survival in these patients was 20 months. And I think this is an oncological outcome where you can say you can do these procedures with a benefit for the patients compared to the standard resections. For the last point of my talk, I want to give you a little overview over the neoadjuvant therapy concepts and the impact of the neoadjuvant therapy, which we in Heidelberg usually apply to patients where the arterial vessels seem to be involved from the preoperative CT scans, as I've shown you before. This is our collective of 215 patients. They underwent a neoadjuvant radiochemotherapy with 50 to 54 gray and gemcitabine in combination over a six-week period. Then we had six weeks for downstaging of the tumor, and after three months, we do a restaging and plan the operation, if ever possible. Of course, this is an example with a very good response, as you see in this part of the picture here. This is a large pancreatic head tumor. This is the planning CT of the radiation therapy, and this is the stage after three months. Of course, not every patient has this good response. 
In the restaging after three months, we see the indication for an exploration in approximately one out of four patients, 26%, maybe 30%, in some studies 35%, I will show you that. However, when we can perform a resection, we have 80% R0 and R1 resection, which is of course quite good outcome for patients which were judged irresectable before, before the neoadjuvant treatment. And when we look at the survival, this is better, significantly better if you do a resection than if you don't do a resection. And of course, it even improves more when you can achieve an R0 resection or you can achieve a complete tumor response and the pathologist only writes you there are no more vital tumor cells in this resected specimen. How about the literature on this topic? One study is no study. This is what you know. This is a meta-analysis from 2010. Should we apply this only to patients that are not resectable? Should we apply this maybe also to patients which are resectable? And you see there's growing interest in this therapy concept. This is the number of studies and reviews published during the last 15 years. This is going steadily up and is still increasing, still in the last one or two years. This ends 2009. Um, what the authors of this meta-analysis could show is that you have no significant differences after the neoadjuvant treatment in terms of morbidity, mortality, and survival of the patients, which is important information, I think, to the surgeon because you sometimes have the impression when there was a neoadjuvant treatment, this is much more bleeding or this is much more inflammatory response or something. But if you pool the data, if you do a meta-analysis, this is not increased from the mortality and the morbidity point of view. Um, the median survival in the resectable and the non-resectable groups in this analysis was 23 versus 20 months, which is quite similar. Now, how are these data compared to the patients not treated before? And I think this is the most important slide of this study. If you have a resectable tumor and you do a resection, you achieve 21 to 23 months median survival. If you take these patients to neoadjuvant treatment, you have a median survival of 23%. I think this is quite impressive and shows you already the main message that you should not do this at the current point of time. If you have an advanced locally unresectable tumor, of course the situation is different. Neoadjuvant treatment resection, you have the same figures. Neoadjuvant treatment, no resection or palliative situation, of course, much worse for the patient. Therefore, resectable tumors should not be suspected to our neoadjuvant treatment in our opinion because there's no obvious advantage, survival is the same. Of course, the not resectable tumors, we should do this, and approximately one-third to one-fourth of the patient get resectable after three months, and if you can achieve an R0 resection, you have the best outcome for the patient possible in this situation. For the end, I just want to show you an interesting case which is not advanced from the oncological point of view, but which is advanced from the patient's point of view, which we did about eight weeks ago. This was a patient, 66 years old. He presented with histologically proven ampullary cancer. What we saw in the preoperative CT scans, which I will show you soon, is that the patient had a chronic arteriosclerotic occlusion of the superior mesenteric artery of two centimeters of length to three centimeters of length, which is shown in this scheme, which means the complete small bowel was depending on the perfusion via the gastroduodenal artery for the arterial supply. This were the CT scans, where you can see this very nicely, the occlusion of the mesenteric artery and the strong gastroduodenal artery, as well as the dilated ducts as a consequence of the ampullary cancer. You can see it even better in this slide. This is the occluded mesenteric artery, which is filled here, and this is the gastroduodenal artery supplying the small bowel. So, what could we do? We explored this patient. We knew this before. We confirmed the chronic occlusion, the complete occlusion of the mesenteric artery in this patient, and we saw that the entire small bowel would be ischemic if we took away the gastroduodenal artery during the Whipple procedure. However, we had to perform the Whipple procedure due to the ampullary cancer. What was the salvage strategy? We mobilized the pancreas completely from the left side took out the spleen and the pancreas under preservation of the splenic artery, which is shown here. We could prepare this over a very long distance. After finishing this, we cut the superior mesenteric artery in this place. This is the base of the mesenteric artery. This is the distal portion. We transposed the splenic artery onto the mesenteric artery, which is shown in this slide. This is the suture in progress. 
and this is the final situation. We put the mesenteric artery on the supply of the splenic artery shown here, and this is the final situs where you see this is the bilateral anastomosis after total pancreatectomy. I have to mention, whenever we do an arterial anastomosis in Heidelberg, we always perform a total pancreatectomy. We do no Whipple procedures, we do no distal pancreatectomies due to the fistula danger, because arterial anastomosis and fistula will end up in a disaster. This is our experience. And this was the resected specimen with the ampullary cancer. This was the final zetus with the transposition of the splenic artery on the mesenteric artery. We had a blood flow of nearly 400 milliliters per minute after finishing the anastomosis. And the patient was discharged after 12 days with an uneventful postoperative cause. I think this shows you that um, this is possible not only in tumors that are advanced and are problematic from this side, but also in patients that are advanced from their comorbidities, and therefore you can improve a little their outcome if you take these techniques into account. For conclusion, um, advanced pancreatic cancer surgery, from our point of view, we do not do extended lymph adenectomies. We stay with a standard lymph adenectomy. We do a resection of the venous axis, the portal venous superior mesenteric axis, whenever technically possible. We do arterial resections only in selected patients. Classical patient is the young patient with an advanced tumor. You want to help and you have a very low morbidity afterwards. And we do neoadjuvant treatment only in patients which are considered primarily irresectable, um, mostly due to arterial infiltration, resulting in a resection quote of 25 to 30 percent. Afterwards, we do not do neoadjuvant therapy on patients that are resectable at the moment. However, of course, the SPAC studies are coming up, and maybe this will change within the next five years whenever data are available on this um, issue, which underline another conclusion. Thank you very much for your attention, and please feel free for any questions.